Okay, we're recording, and I want to thank all my viewers once again here on my YouTube channel for GaudiumAtSpace22.com, my my little tiny blog uh, that's read by a few people. And uh, I'm really excited once again to be joined by my colleague, my former colleague, my my buddy, Dr. Rodney Hauser. And also, though, the guest of honor today that we will both be conversing with, uh, Dr. Jennifer, Jennifer Newsom Martin, who... Uh, are you still an assistant professor at, uh, no, or are you associate? Sadly. I'm associate these days. That's oh, a, sadly is right. Now you're stuck. Now I'm on all the committees. <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking at the back of the book and it says assistant professor. And I thought, I bet she's been upgraded. So yeah, sure you I are. Yeah, the upgrade. <laughs> she's associate professor in the program of liberal studies with a concurrent appointment in the Department of Theology, University of Notre Dame. My wife is a domer. She graduated there in 1988 or 89, something like that. Oh. Uh, so, so we know Notre Dame well. And I'm reading off the back cover of, of a truly wonderful book, Jennifer. I'm telling you, I'm about, I'm a little over halfway through it. I'll show it to my viewers right here. Hans Urs von Balthasar and the Critical Appropriation of Russian Religious Thought. Uh, and I have to say, I, I'm, I'm, I always say this to my viewers when I'm plugging a guest book, you know, run out and buy this. If you are interested at all in Balthazar, you need this book, because in my opinion, and Rodney, you can tell me, too, um, I think it's the only work out there right now that deals with Balthazar's uh, appropriation of shelling and his appropriation of the three Russian greats, Bulgakov, Soloviev, Berdyaev. Um, and it and it really, really unpacks a few mysteries as to where Balthazar gets some of his stuff about, um, well, as, as, as Anthony Sigliatano said on the back on the blurb, and this is so true, uh, you know, it gets gets right down to where Balthazar gets the urkinosis idea in the Trinity, infinite distance and in, infinite closeness in the Trinity. A lot of this stuff finds its roots in, in, in the Russians. Uh, but he's also critical of, of the Russians and, of course, of Schelling. Uh, so that's we'll get into that in a bit. Uh, but I want to start because that's what really pro prompted me to want to interview here is uh, you had this wonderful article in Comunio in their in their uh, edition on mediation, spring 2021. And the article is called The Annunciation of the Flesh bodily mediation in the work of Charles Peggy. And I am a big fan of Charles Peggy. So let's, I'm going to start with, because once again, we have a very eclectic viewership on these YouTube channels. And oftentimes when I've thrown out the name Peggy on here, I get little emails saying, who is Charles Peggy? Please. And they spell it, you know, P-E-G-E-E -E -E or something like this. Uh, so maybe you could begin by just giving us, first off, a, a brief synopsis of who Peggy was. Um, died young, was killed in World War I, French, I know that much. Uh, but maybe you could flesh that that brief introduction out just a bit. Absolutely, yeah. He's um, like all of, a lot of my favorite interlocutors. Uh, he's a friend of Balthazar's, which is why he's a friend of mine now, you know. So, uh, you know, Balthazar is, of course, the Swiss Catholic Jesuit um, for uh, who wrote a, a lot of the theological aesthetics in uh, in recent history, and uh, he's got a lot of stuff about um, various styles of theology. And uh, Peggy is the twelfth style uh, for him, yes. which means, um, in a lot of ways, the culminating uh, style or mode of what Baltazar says, circling around the glory and all of these different modes and and language, and um, because it's a it's a impenetrable mystery and it requires a polyphony or in Baltazarian language a symphony of voices to be able to uh to articulate it even asymptotically um but uh Peggy yes is uh is absolutely uh, fascinating to me um like I said I met I met him through Baltazar so to speak but um but he was born in 1873 uh in very very uh connected with France. Uh, he's, he's, all of his work is so grounded, is very incarnational. Uh, he has a special devotion to uh, St. Joan of Arc and is always uh, talking about St. Joan of Arc, especially in his poetic triptych. Um, probably the most famous uh, in the Anglophone world is uh, the portal of the mystery of hope. Yes. Um, made popular in uh, no small part because of David Schindler Jr.'s translation of it when he was uh, at Casa Baltazar in uh, in Rome. I don't remember what year it was, uh, maybe in the last 
15 years or so um yeah. translated that but um but that's the most popular one but it's it's actually the middle of a kind of poetic triptych where you have uh, the mystery of um, the charity of Joan of Arc and then the portal of the mystery of hope and then uh, the mystery of the holy innocence about the massacre of the innocents by Herod um, and the whole thing that even the the middle part which looks like a soliloquy or a monologue um, between God and an unnamed person is um, Joan of Arc is present in this in this kind of like middle space, which I find very interesting, right? So so you can read it on its own, um, but you can also read it in its kind of larger context. He also wrote some interesting prose work. Um, I've done a little bit of work with what was most recently translated of his in uh, 2019. That was his uh, note on Descartes and his note on Henri Bergson. This is uh, prose uh, and not poetry, but he, um, it's actually kind of tragic to read these because the first was published uh, posthumously, 1914. He took a bullet to the head in the war and uh, was uh, killed like very early on in the war, um, walking, it was a bullet right in the front of the head. I mean, he's walking toward, he's always this sort of exuberant, uh, <laughs> like he's not gonna, uh, he's not gonna shrink from anything, uh, kind of recklessly exuberant about everything. Um, but uh, the second text, the one on um, Descartes, wasn't published until 1924, again, posthumously, and it ends uh, with a half a sentence because he was writing and then there's a there's a sentence, there's only half of it, and then he went off to the war and never got to finish the sentence, um, which I don't know, I just, that wow. sentence haunts me sometimes. But yeah, That is he, haunting. That's very haunting. He's yeah. a fascinating, uh, fascinating figure and poet. All right. So uh, but before I go any further, I want to assure viewers, because Jennifer pointed this out this to us off camera before we started, Hauser and I did not coordinate our shirts today <laughs> to uh, to be matching sort of checkered black and white uh, shirts. That was by pure accident. But anyway, uh, so that's a broad outline of Piggy. Now, let's the 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 article that I want to discuss with you, and I'm not going to go slavishly through it. I'm just going to ask you to sort of summarize its high points is is your article on Peggy uh, uh, dealing with the, the theological concept of, of mediation. Uh, and so maybe you can encapsulate some basic points uh, from that essay. And then Hauser, I'll give you a chance for a follow-up question. So be thinking as, as, as you're going along. All right. Usually I just spring it on you. Hey, what do you think, Hauser? So I'm not going to do that to you this time. All right. So go ahead, Jennifer. Oh, sure. Um, this was, um, this is one of the uh, my favorite things I've ever written, actually, because I got to go deep into Peggy and spend a lot of time uh, thinking with him. Um, and I think uh, starting, I start off the article with some um, invocation of uh, the ph phenomenologist Emmanuel Falk, who is a, um, a big fan of Peggy. And uh, he and I have had some conversations about Peggy. Um, he's very dear. Um, but he talks a lot about Peggy as a uh, can I interrupt? Can I bump in there very quickly? I have seen Falk's name come up in, in numerous publications as uh, and I've always been sort of wanting to get some of his works. Um, but I, so I'm presuming that you are a big fan of his phenomenology. I like his work a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's um, I have to look at my shelf to see which ones I have over there. Uh, the one on um, on the Eucharist, I really like. I could get you the title here in just a second, but um, he's very concerned with the uh, the body. Um, yeah, yeah, flesh, and it's it, and his last name for the viewers who are interested is spelled F A L Q U E, so Emmanuel Falk. Uh, so anyway, I interrupted your yes. your disposition here on, on on the essay, but go ahead. Yes, I just uh, the name of the book um, that I'm most familiar with by Emmanuel is. Um, um, the Wedding Feast of the Lamb. And then there's another really lovely book um, that he wrote called God, the Flesh, and the Other, from Irenaeus to Duns Scotus, which is really talking about, he talks so much, I mean, the, when he gets to the Tertullian chapter, and he's talking about um, how Tertullian uh, compares landscape to clods of earth, like uh, musculature. I mean, he's really talking about landscape and flesh and a kind of like wow. highly Christological. It's very powerful. He's a very poetic kind of writer himself. Um, so I think your viewers would appreciate. Um, so no wonder why he likes Peggy. So go ahead yeah. now with summarizing your article Absolutely. in Peggy. So he talks a bit about um, the, uh, the way in which for Peggy, everything has a body. And so everything is embodied 
And this takes a lot of forms, whether the physical body or a national body, uh, everything is, um, is in the flesh, right? You can't get out. Uh, you cannot uh, make what ought be a flesh into a machine, right? And so that's a lot of the, uh, the work that he does in his work on um, Bergson and Descartes, kind of that I mentioned earlier. Um, we can get to that in a bit, but I basically go through a lot of his work, uh, including the portal of the mystery of hope and, um, and talk about how he elevates uh, the body. He elevates, um, well, he, he kind of uh, thinks about the spirit and the body not as antagonistic, but as very, uh, you know, absolutely mutually informing kinds of um, realities. Uh, but he's absolutely fantastic in terms of um, thinking about the Marian body as well, which I find um, very interesting, right? I mean, so he, he's written a lot about, um, about Mary, about the Annunciation. And so what I try to do in this piece is uh, is talk about all of the sites of mediation um, with a, in a particularly Marian key, I guess, or a particularly maternal kind of key. He spends a lot of time uh, thinking about Christ and the suffering um, in terms of lactation and nursing, yeah. which I find really fascinating, right? He says that even, you know, the uh, the roughest martyr was once a tender milky babe. You know, I think that's just <laughs> lovely. Um, and then he takes some of that and, and talks about, um, you know, Christ. He has some poetry which uh, juxtaposes uh, Bethlehem and Jerusalem and has Christ on the cross thinking back to the the swaddling clothes um, that, you know, I mean, it's just a really kind of a lovely way of, uh, of always amplifying Christ's vulnerability, even in, especially in the flesh. Um, what Peggy talks about and what I talk about in this article a lot is um, is a kind of inherent precarity of Christianity, uh, the fragility, right. the risk, uh, the way in which um, God cast himself into uncertain poverty in all of these different ways, um, which I find uh, really kind of lovely. So. It, it is. Um, and uh, that, that, that emphasis on carnality is something that I really want to dig into here. But Hauser, you go ahead. Um, no, thank you so much for that. And thanks for, thanks for that article. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. In fact, that's going to be our next uh, Comunio Study Circle article that we're going to read uh, yes. yeah, next semester. So, uh, yes. so uh, yeah, that's uh, we're looking forward to that very much. Um, maybe just a couple of thoughts. Um, and so so the, the first thing is, I mean, I've heard D.C. Sindler say that he thinks that Peggy, it might be the resource month thinker or the origin of the Comunio school, if you want to call it that or whatever. So, which is always kind of startling when he says that, because you think of all the, like Baltazar, De Lubac, you know, Blondel, you know, think of all these giants, but he, he kind of always comes back to that exact same, he, he's consistently <laughs> insisting that Peggy is the guy. Um, so on that note, and I, and I, 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 I kind of, I want to believe him. I don't know if I have enough evidence yet to believe him, but I certainly, there's a lot of evidence from your piece and the, and the few things I've read by Peggy to prove that it's true, but I've been thinking a lot and Larry has too lately, um, about the, the second Vatican council, the various groups, you know, that are, that are kind of involved in the council of vying for, you know, space in the, in the documents and things. And it seems to me that what's interesting about the resource mont folk that were there is is that I mean we could kind of see them as the the moderates the center you know between say the stodgy Thomas and the and the progressive future concilium school people but but it's really actually that's probably not the best way to think of it it's more that it seems that in some ways at least in their mind the sort of baroque Thomists and the and the future, at least the radical future concilium school of uh, folk, sort of have maybe things in common that people like Peggy sort of reject on both sides. So, 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 I mean, we could talk about the the, the kind of a historical nature of the understanding of revelation that comes out of kind of Baroque Tom Suarez and, and and people like that. Um. Which, which has a difficult time explaining why God bothered to become a man <laughs> or worse, a baby, right? And, and all of that stuff, right? Why not just drop a bunch of propositions down and clarify what it is we believe about God and things like that? So that's kind of on the one hand, 
But then on the other hand, there's a kind of, um, it seems to be a kind of lack of confidence on some of the more radical concilium types that this thing that happened 2000 years ago can still be relevant. That, that in order to become relevant, we have to do something almost radically new, you know, that find another source for revelation perhaps, or, or, you know, cozy up to the Frankfurt school in various ways, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But certainly we can't keep talking about Jesus Christ as if he's the unique mediator of salvation. That just isn't going to get it done. So I, that's been on my mind lately. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm sorry if that's kind of my own thing, but I, I, I find your, your stuff on Peggy to be relevant to this. So I just, do you have anything to say about that? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I find it really interesting that it wasn't a theologian who kind of coined the term resource mom, but it was Peggy himself, uh, right? in, uh, you know, in, he, he was not writing uh, really theologically, but, um, you know, he talks about, you know, re when he's talking about revolution and he says, what, it, you know, when you, re a, re a true revolution isn't kind of upending everything and starting over and sort of scorch the earth and we're going to, we're going to, you know, do something new. Um, but a true revolution is to resource kind of the ancient spring and bring it to life. Right. I mean, so he talks so much about, um, about this very complex understanding of time where, um, uh, to go, to go forward is also to go backward, right? I mean, so, um, so yeah. I mean, he. I think. I think Schindler is absolutely right to say that uh, Peggy is at the the heart, the uh, the stream, the um, the spring of resource mont thinking. Uh, he he talks so much about this sort of metaphor of of the kind of like uh, eternal spring, which is always welling up, right? It's always dynamic. It's not sort of some old dusty thing you have to go like get and dust off to hand, like Balthazar says, like uh, like bricks from hand to hand. It's living, right? I mean, it's this, uh, it's the little trembling flame from the portal of the mystery of hope, which is always, um, it's always born forth on um, the, the flesh of those who are eternally going to mass. He says. I mean, it's a really lovely kind of idea. Uh, so yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I actually have an, another piece where I, uh, it, it's in uh, Darren Sarisky's book on um, theologies of retrieval, where I, I try to sort of make that same kind of argument um, that that Peggy is um, is really important for thinking about ressourcement um, because it, he does refuse the conservative and the progressive positions with equal yes. kind of, uh, you know, fervor, right? I mean, he's, he's so impossible to categorize right i mean he absolutely upends all of those kind of uh, binary categories that are just so exhausted um, and exhausting <laughs> and he's right there at that kind of dynamic polar center uh, of energy right where you can't um you can't know things ahead of time right you, and so i, I mean I, I find yeah that that he's he's perfect for for the kinds of things you're saying holding that um that tense middle between i mean balthazar did the same thing right i mean he says the same things about um that he's been cast out on the dung heap by both the left and the right. So, you know, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, so I find, I think that's, that's a hundred percent correct. Um, and I think actually his stuff on um, Peggy's stuff on Bergson is really helpful and interesting here. So Bergson is, you know, a philosopher, French philosopher who was very um, controversial uh, after Jacques Maritain liked him and then didn't after he wrote a lot of uh, kind of more, controversial things. He wrote a book called Creative Evolution, which did seem to uh, make, um, to overemphasize the sort of futurity and structural openness to the future and what may come. And, you know, it's uh, it's not exactly uh, appropriable for Christian content because, you know, I want the content at the end of the day. I don't want just, you know, structural messianism or whatever. But, um, but it is very interesting because in uh, Balthazar's preface or forward to his book on Gregory of Nyssa, some of those old, older uh, works on the patristics. Um, he's quoting without attribution, quoting Peggy's book on Bergson as a kind of like manifesto for how he's thinking about retrieving Gregory. Uh, it's like, you know, all the, it's what De Lubac says about origin, right? We're all sort of standing around um, the mystery of Christ. And so origin is our our brother, he's our contemporary. Uh, it's so I, I think, uh, yeah, there's this, there's a sense in which um, the way Bergson talks about time is very much resistant to this idea of like one damn thing after another kind of linear. Yeah. Uh, it's just this accumulation yeah. of things where reality becomes um, 
you know, the reality of, of Christ becomes further and further in the distance. Um, but it's this notion of, uh, he talks, he calls it duration, right? It's this like living uh, flux of, um, of living time where things can be contemporaneous um, and we don't have to accept the uh, sort of modern or enlightenment definition of history or a sort of sci overly scientific version of history. Uh, I mean, those historiogra historiographical, um, the way it gets smuggled in to theology, I find really frustrating. Um, you know, we don't have to accept this kind of impoverished notion of what history is yeah. and what it can demonstrate. Um, Wow, there's just there's so much in there that we that we could talk about. Um, one one being, uh, you know, in the introduction to your book on on Balthazar and the Russians, you, you talk a lot about Balthazar's theological method, as in a sense grounded in doctrine and dogma, grounded in the truth. Uh, it's not just willy nilly speculation, but not afraid of speculation, a kind of uh, Christian gnosis, a kind of, you know, the pistis brings gnosis, faith brings a certain kind of knowledge, uh, and that knowledge allows you then to be very expansive in how you engage other thinkers and other traditions, uh, you know, that are out like, like a Bergson and, and, and people like that, uh, and, and maybe you can comment on that, but also along the, the sort of same lines of, of speculation and engaging the world. Um, one of the most fascinating things to me in your article was the, the, the juxtaposition of the concept of, of, of change with a sort of static and that actually modernity for all of its flux, for all of its change, for all of its emphasis on history and fluidity and fungibility and all that kind of stuff is actually extremely oriented towards the static. It has no real sense of how to properly manage change because it wants to manage and control sort of bureaucratically, technocratically. Whereas in Peggy, Peggy has this sort of profound sense of truth as like this organism, this living thing. And because it's alive and organismic, it can actually underwrite a much more profound concept of real change. So could could you uh, you want to comment on that? Absolutely. Uh, so this is where the um, the book on Bergson and Descartes comes in mostly into this article, right? Because uh, this is where he's uh, he's advancing a very strong critique of uh, modernity, which is exactly um, what you've said. Uh, conserving. I mean, he, he's got these kind of metaphors of um, of conserving something cold. You know, that you're you're putting it away, you're saving it, or you're hoarding it, or you are. You're commodifying um, things that cannot be commodified. You're making things countable that can't be countable. I mean, so so yeah, he talks a lot about um, the way in which um, modernity. Uh, let me see if I could find the. Uh, yes, here's some here's some nice text um, from Peggy. He says uh, that modernity's attempt to economize. Um, well, this is my language, actually. Maternity's attempt to economize and homogenize and sterilize, effectively to make barren, is resonant with forms of modern history that can only, quote, conserve through cold, that's his language, not through the gentle, progressive cultivation of life, through the mediations of time, flesh, and history, but rather through processes that arrest growth for the sake of more convenient, efficient preservation. Right? He says, this is his language, um, that the god of money, uh, cannot secure faith, theology, philosophy, metaphysics, morality, civics, economics, poetics, the fine and musical arts, reality and fact, right? So everything that we care about. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Modernity is not good at it because uh, those things require the um, kind of temporal extension in time and in space and in um, the sort of messy life of uh, human beings who don't quite have it figured out, which is why I find, you know, what he says about the only state of Christianity is precariousness, this kind of radical precariousness. We're very much um, not, we don't like being, things being precarious. I mean, I don't like things being precarious, but, but I find the idea absolutely um, astonishing because to me that um, the precarity of all of Christianity that sort of you know like on the one hand you think that's a strange thing to say but on the other hand that we have this system of um, 
of sacraments of embodied. Like I read, Larry, I read your thing about the synod recently about the beeswax candles, right? I mean, you need yeah, um, yeah. You need the beeswax candles to drip and to be at least fifty one percent beeswax. <laughs> you need that stuff. You can't have the uh, the electric light. You can't have these things that have been um, that has, have removed us so much from the really real. Um, so that's those are the places where we touch. And I have to say. So, I wrote that article for Catholic World Report right. after I read your essay. In okay. fact, I quoted, I think I quoted you. You in, did. In, I was very honored. <laughs> yeah. And because you inspired you, the, your whole thing here on Peggy and mediation and carnality and, and all of that and, and uh, organismic living growth that inspired me. And that's what motivated really that whole meditation that and, and DC Schindler's Schindler, quote. About, right. Yeah. And, and DC Schindler's quote about the hell with the, the electric votive lights. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All horrors, he said, or something along those lines. Um, but yeah, so uh, we'll get back to Rodney. You can step in at any time and I'll get back to you in a second, but I want to return then to uh, uh, the concept of, of, uh, the related concepts of historicity, carnality, materiality, and risk and precarity. Uh, that, and I'm thinking of a, a book by Jonathan Serralo too that just came out on on, on Balthazar's Eucharistic uh, theology of how from from the very first moments of the incarnation, it's a Eucharistic breaking. It's a Eucharistic sort of giving of himself away that involves in, in a certain sense, analogical risk on God's part, precarity on God's part. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, um, I hope I'm doing that justice, but maybe you could comment on that. Uh, Jonathan Serralo, he is um, such an elegant writer and such yes. a wonderful thinker. I mean, I just think he is one of the very best of the best that's out there. Um, so yeah, his um, his book is just over here. I haven't finished it yet, but um, but it's beautifully it's written. It's great. It's, it's so a great book. Conceived. I mean, I just think it's a fantastic book. Um, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, both Jonathan and I um, appreciate this aspect of Balthazar's thinking, right? That uh, it's like every everything, every sort of. I mean, for when you read like Balthazar's metaphysics, like in um, Theologic One or Theologic Three, it's all kind of in there where he's talking about. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, building on kind of Ferdinand Ulrich, which a, a lot of people are doing interesting things on Ulrich these days, um, but that uh, everything in the world, being itself has like a chalice-like character, right? That it's all kind of yes. itself yes. away in this kind of like, uh, I mean, this is such a rich ontology where um, it's not just, you know, human beings who participate in this canonic thing or just the Trinitarian persons. It's being itself, um, donating it to the experience of a subject right I mean I, I find that so fascinating um so that everything kind of participates I um, mean in a way it's like it's like you know it's like Hopkins poetry too when he's talking about the uh what's the one where he talks about uh the last line is gash gold vermilion um I don't know if I can't really, I won't be able to remember all oh. of that but you know, maybe how I know the poem you're talking about, but I can't think of the title of it yeah, either. It's I think been it might years. be. Um, I think it might be the wind hover. Uh, but anyway, it's uh, he's he's very Could much be. like Hopkins is very much doing kind of what what, what Balthazar is doing, and Balthazar, of course, in his essay on Hopkins, brings this up, right? That these birds in the sky are are forming crosses with their wings, and the um, the sacrifice of all sort of natural things, participating in the sacrifice of Christ, and it's the sacrifice of Christ which is why there are um, birds and soil and vermilion. You know, so it's really kind of, a, again, very strange to think about temporally, but beautiful, beautiful to think about theologically. Um, well, yeah, and to, to view, rather than to view the incarnation through nature as a kind of neutral propedeutic, uh, then upon which the incarnation gets added, uh, I just find it so exhilarating these days to see so many people doing work on viewing creation through the lens of the incarnation, doing mm -hmm. it the other way. Schmemann was already doing that when he says things like, you know, God created water for baptism. And then, oh, yeah, by the right, way, exactly. yeah, exactly. yeah the, by the way, we also drink it and it keeps us alive. Mm -hmm. And and I, Jordan Wood uh, recently, too, in his book on Maximus, the confessor that just came out, makes the exact same point. <laughs> creation mm -hmm. doesn't make it. We need to view everything right down to you know, sticks and leaves and, you know, and everything in the world around us as, as a sacramental iconic manifestation 
of some aspect of the incarnation. Uh, and, and I, I just think that sort of you're doing the same thing. But Hauser, I'm dominating the conversation here. Do you want to do you want to add? Uh, I am thoroughly enjoying this, you know, just sitting back and listening. This is awesome. But uh, no, I, I mean, th th this is really, really, it seems to me interesting stuff. And, and, it, and it sort of, um, yeah, it sort of takes me back to the point that, that, I was, that I was trying to get at last time too, which was um, this does get missed on both sides, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it, 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 and, uh, and, it, and it's the, yeah, I mean, the dualistic uh, nature of some of the neo-scholastic Thomism that that sort of doesn't want to talk about nature in this way. Or I remember, I just anecdotally, I, you know, I, I when I teach sacraments at the sales, I use Schmemann's uh, for the life of the world. And I have some, you know, borderline trad Catholic students who get super, they don't like that book. <laughs> <laughs> there's something about that book that doesn't sit right with them. They're like, this is, this is heresy, isn't it? <laughs> like to say that water is made in order for that, you know, and stuff like that. And so, um, but it also gets to something else. And I think this is true of Peggy's thought as far as I know also, but it's, it's a kind of um, radically Christocentric way of thinking about reality. Right. And this can, and, and this can happen like in, 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 um, in the doctrine of salvation, this can go wrong, and maybe we could talk about Peggy stuff about hope in this in this context. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you know, one way of thinking about salvation is that God creates the world with this intention in mind, and then Adam wrecks it, and now God's got to he's got to go. Oh no, now what? And then you know, oh, we better have an incarnation and a cross and all that stuff to, to fix the thing. Whereas, you know, the Eastern fathers were always good at reminding us that this lamb was slain from the foundation of the world, right? That, that, that it's, it, God's not taken by surprise by, by <laughs> a couple of human beings doing something stupid. I mean, we're sheep, right? So, so he's got a, it, it, so the point would be then that the, that, that Christ is not in the image of Adam. Adam is in the image of Christ, right? right? So, so if we say that now, all of reality ought to have this kind of this kind of Christic uh, so, sort of nature that we're talking about, right? That that birds ought to be cruciform and 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 things giving themselves to other things. I mean, that ought to be the truth of reality, rather than the cross being a sort of simple reversal of nature, right? That's kind of what we're getting at. And again, I think both ends of the spectrum, the radical progressives on the one hand, and radical trads on the other don't want to think of that as being the case one is ready to kind of say let's put the crucifixion behind us and talk about mm -hmm. something more relevant and one is going to say well this is something radically undoing the natural order or something like that so um so maybe two things uh two questions in the light of that jenny um one would be uh one of the things that really kept Peggy away from the faith at, at one point in his life was its doctrine of, of Massa Damnata. Yeah. So, so maybe we could talk a little bit about his understanding of hope, which I think would be interesting. And then maybe in the, and if we, if, if that's not enough, I also am curious, cause I just don't know the answer. And this is a kind of a silly historical question, but I, but I think it's actually, there's something important in it. How much did Peggy know Blondell? I should know the answer to that probably, but I don't. And I, I'm kind of curious because so much in Blondell sounds to me like mm -hmm. so much in Peggy. And I'm wondering if there's a literary influence there or is it just they're both onto something that's true and they, they both stumbled on it in different ways. I'd be surprised, in other words, if Peggy didn't know about Blondell and read him and that stuff. So you can do those in either order. Uh, Hope on the one hand and and then the Blondell influence maybe on the other. Well, I'll take the... Uh, I don't actually know if there's a if there's a link, but I have the same impulse. Um, I mean, I think Ann Carpenter would probably know uh, her book uh, on uh, tradition and um, th that just came out. Uh, it's called um, Nothing. Nothing. Something gained is eternal. Is yeah, that right? yeah, 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 that's yeah. it. But anyway, that's she's that she'd be an interesting interlocutor too. I think. Um, but she, you yeah. know, there's a lot of Blondell and a lot of Peggy in okay. that book as well um, as some other things. But she would certainly know the, the answer to the question. But I think um, there's something right that. Uh, intuitively I put them in my mind together as well as you do Rodney but um yeah. I mean in, in terms of thinking about um Peggy on hope um I mean of course he names the second uh mono, you know that sort of book link poem the portal is the mystery of hope after this theological virtue and um I'm on on paper it sounds like something I would hate you know there's this little girl hope and she's always le you know it just sounds so saccharine but he manages to make hope um not saccharine at all right I mean he talks a lot about in that poem um 
about the uh, the grief, the universal grief. Yes, of yes. When he's talking about the parable of uh, of the lost son and the father and the, pro the prodigal son, he says that uh, there's no one in you know, 1500 years who has read that without a lump rising in his throat, right? Yeah. So that, that, and once hope has bitten into your heart, leaving these teeth marks that she will not uh, leave it behind, right? I mean, so mm -hmm. there's a sense in which like hope on the one hand can sound very, um, very nice and, and pious and saccharine and that kind of makes, mm, like, okay, you know, it's fine. But, but I mean, to me, this kind of um, visceral hope that comes out in Peggy, I find so, so attractive. He has this really interesting text. It's not in that book, but um, it's called The Secret of the Man of 40. And he says, uh, this is a kind of um, sort of secret that's traded in back alleys and kind of like on the streets and on the side of the roads. And like when you're 20, there's no way you're going to get it. When you're 39, you might start to think you understand. But when you're 40, you know you're initiated into this great secret. And the secret is no one is happy and no one has ever been happy. <laughs> he says, and still uh, you look upon your child and you think this time it will be different. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, there's that kind of like that hope that is like um, informed by all of the weight of life. Um, but it's still that kind of hoping against hope that this time it will be different. And so anyway, in the poem, um, he talks about um, how human beings have introduced hope into the heart of God, right? So that God is very much this idea of the, the, you know, the father of the prodigal son who goes out to the end of the lane and is waiting and is watching and is maybe you won't turn up, you know, I hope you will, but maybe you won't. Um, and so, yeah, this idea that, um, that if God hopes, um, then there's, there's no one who uh, is sort of, uh, going to fall through the cracks, right? And there's this, he talks a lot about, um, you know, going out, leaving the 99 and searching for the one. And yeah. and the one, he says, in God's calculus, he says, uh, the one weighs more. The one weighs more. The one who makes, who introduced hope in the heart of God, it weighs more. Uh, and Peggy says, you know, this is insane. But he says, this is how the books are kept with God. <laughs> I just <laughs> love that. I uh, love that kind of image. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, yeah, this idea that um, that hope is is not something that doesn't cost us something. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, he says even in Portal: The Mystery of Hope, you know, like we adults um, have become so uh, disappointed. We we expect disappointment all the time, uh, but children. Uh, children um, run back and forth like puppies. You know, they think they think uh, something new is happening. Uh, so uh, yeah, there's uh, there's a lot uh, I think there that we can. Uh, he says that we they are they are the child Jesus. We only remember, but they are the child Jesus. Uh, so anyway, yeah, his stuff on hope is um, is thoroughly uh, compelling to me. Um, and I, I don't want to in interrupt your line of questioning, but I did want to say a little something if I could about the water thing that Larry was bringing up earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah, feel free, yeah, feel free. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. So um, I've been really into Paul Claudel lately, um, which is another poet that I've, I've met through Balthazar uh, because you know he was very interested in Claudel. He wrote the, um, the forward to the Satin Slipper and translated it and all of this. And so he's one of his, his sort of dear friends. But um, I just, I wrote a piece for uh, a collection about um, how waterlogged Paul Claudel is, uh, and he does these, he, he is a poet of many things, but um, in his five great odes, he has the second great ode is called The Spirit and the Water, and he talks a lot about um, all of this kind of liquidity, um, anything, I mean, it's not just water itself, it's, um, it's tears, it's the sea, it's breast milk, it's like any kind of like fluid thing that uh, connects us to God, right? He, he talks about this is this is what um, the kind of like dynamic sort of substance in which we come to meet God, like anything fluid. I mean, it's really kind of interesting, mm -hmm. but um, he talks a lot about um, water and desire and water and the sea. In his last few texts, um, he stops writing poetry kind of uh, at some point in his life and starts writing these biblical commentaries, but he puts his own name in the titles, right? So it's not just a commentary on, it's Paul Claudel, 
interrogates the apocalypse or Paul Claudel interrogates the Song of Songs. And uh, I can't remember, I won't be able to quote it exactly, but there's this one line in his, uh, when he's talking about water in the Song of Songs, where he says, uh, I was thirsty, I was thirsty, and someone brought to me a sea that was thirsty for me. <laughs> I just love this idea that um, wow, these yeah. characters can drink the whole sea because the sea, God is thirsty for us. I mean, just it's just beautiful stuff. So anyway, um, a plug for reading Claudel uh, while we're making plugs for things. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But I, you know, I, to go back to the prodigal son thing, um, and then I, I, I do want to move on to your book on Russian theology and, and Balthazar. But, you know, I, I loved your dog analogy because I have dogs, you know, and I, my one dog, Leo, the Border Collie, you know, he gets all agitated, wants to go outside, wants to go outside. He can't wait to get outside. And he's excited. You open the door and boom, he's outside. And he does his thing. And in 45 seconds, you say, let's go back inside. He's all excited. Like, OK, let's get back inside. I want to see what happened in there in the 45 seconds since I haven't been in there. And then he runs around the house when he gets in like, well, OK, what's new in here? And that is so much that is very much like a child. Uh, and I think to a certain extent, it's what Jesus meant when he said, unless you become like this child, he didn't just mean innocence. He meant that the world of a child is a world of mystification and magic. The world is, you know, charged with God's grandeur, to, to go back to Hopkins, for, for a child. Everything is new. Everything is fresh. Everything is a conquest. Everything is something exciting. You get the point. And we get more and more jaded as we get older. We lose the mystification of life. We lose the mystical quality of life, the magical quality of life. And, and so to say, yeah, we're all Nobody's happy. And, and nobody's happy precisely because we spend the rest of our lives, in some sense, trying to recapture that sense of the mystical that we sort of inchoately, intuitively know is what we're made for. Um, and, and yet it's something that it's a taste for it that we've lost mm -hmm. as, as we grow into an adulthood. And so it's, it's almost like, you know, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O oh Lord. You know, it's an Augustinian moment. And when I read um, well, both Claudel, but also Peggy, I, I, get, I get that sense in his emphasis on historicity, bodiliness, carnality, that God comes to us through the mediations of things, um, that what he's, what he's trying to do is to recover in us that sense of the magic of things, all right? It's not just water. It's not just my body, my skin. This is the very stuff that God made precisely for the incarnation. And maybe you can comment on that. It's not really a question. It's just sort of a, a comment of mine. Do you yeah. mind, Larry, if I just interject? Because yeah, I think this would, I think this is relevant, and then Jenny can kind of bring it all together. But I just, I'm just thinking about. It, it seems to me that 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 what we just kind of figured out. I mean, it's just sort of obvious, but I'm stupid, so it takes me sometimes a while. But uh, um, like, a, what all the poet is is an adult that hasn't lost his his or her childhood, right? I mean, I, I, so I was thinking, like, when I was reading your thing on Peggy, I'm teaching. Um, I was teaching orthodoxy by Chesterton at the time. And, and Chesterton is just a big kid. He, he's just an overgrown child. And, and, and everything he looks at, the reason he's so funny is because everything delights him. You know what I mean? And, and even his enemies like Shaw and all these guys he goes after, he, he loves them to death kind of. He's, he finds Shaw delightfully stupid or <laughs> delightfully wrong or whatever, but he gets a kick out of it. And, and there's a kind of like childlikeness and I was the reason I was thinking this, Larry, is because I was reading your the thing that you posted today uh, um, on on Big Dave, and uh, and I was reading Rachel's thing about how funny Dave was, and 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 it's it comes out of this. He was also like a big kid, like he was just always kind of yeah. goofing around and messing with. He was like, hey, I remember one time we were at a conference. He goes, hey, let's go check the basketball. So we sneak out and check the. It was Marquette was in the final four, you know, back with Dwayne Wade and all that. And he had to go see if they were they were winning. But just like he's just like a big kid, you know, he's kind of he knows he's doing something a little bit mischievous or whatever. But it seems to me that this is what is hitting me from kind of what you're saying, Jenny, is that um, poetry is important because it reminds us of how special reality is. And it's and it's it literally is it's it, it's 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 a childlike 
reflection on reality. That's what, you know, it's playing with yeah. words and capturing things and, and description and all that stuff, reminding us of what we've forgotten as jaded adults who are unhappy is that you're like, oh, what's next? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Well, and, uh, yeah. And before uh, Jennifer uh, comments on that, uh, to, I'm glad you mentioned Chesterton and orthodoxy because there's that great, and it's totally appropriate that we're talking about here. There's a great quote from Chesterton in there about, is it automatic necessity that makes every daisy the same? Or is it that God looks at a daisy and so likes it? He says, do it again, do it again and do it, do it again. again. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, that, that's in a sense what the poets are doing. They're, they're looking at a concrete thing. They're drawing out of it its superchargedness and saying, do it again, do it again. But anyway, I Jennifer. Think there's something, I love what both of you are saying. This is so fun. Um, I mean, to me, uh, yeah, I mean, kids are, I have three kids and they are, uh, they're always in their bodies, right? I mean, they don't, they never aren't in their bodies, right? And uh, like we, we tend to kind of want not to be in our bodies. I guess we're getting older and older, but um <laughs> But yeah, I, think, I want hair. I want hair again. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. But what's really interesting to me, in addition to the really lovely things you've both said, is um it yeah, it's 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 a sort of refusal to let words be um like lose their friction or something like that. Like they yeah, so words they're not gonna be kind of like commercialized or like homogenized or you know like turned into a Hallmark card where you just your mind just can't grab onto what it is because it's been you know through the market forces and it's not even <laughs> a word anymore or a message anymore but poets um they don't forget the flesh or the sound of a word right i mean it's words aren't just meaning waste in, in order to transmit some message or sell you something or whatever words uh you delight even in the very sounds as your mouth is making them right i mean so it, that's yeah. a very incarnational thing too yeah. um you know i always think about um this Russian poet, uh, Osip Mandelstam, what he says, uh, mm. oh, what does he say? What's meaning but vanity? Um, oh, what's the line? Um, a word is a sound, one of the handmaidens of the seraphim, right? So it's like, before yeah. it is trying to communicate, it is it is a sound and you can feel like all the, I mean, think about Hopkins again. I mean, um, the way that he plays with the music of words and the way that they they appear to the ear and the rhythm, uh, all of the ways in which he's marking the rhythm of a thing, that is a refusal to let a word, um, you know, stop being a body and, a, and a, a noise. So I think, yeah, I think this is also, I think that's yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, this is, yeah, this is a great conversation. I'm really enjoying this. And uh, I hate to move on from Peggy, but I, but I want to because I, I've been like I said, it's it's 10 to 12, which means we have a little more time. Um, but I'm just so enjoying this book of yours on Hans Urs von Baldassar. I, I want to bring it up. And uh, right off the bat in the introduction, you, you, you captured me because um, as much as I appreciate and liked Kevin Mongrain's book, on Balthazar as, uh, you know, he worked with Cyril O'Regan and he's got the whole sort of, you know, Balthazar as an essentially engaging in an Irenaean retrie retrieval. And that Irenaeus is probably the guy with the most sort of architectonic sort of influence on Balthazar's whole system. And there's, and, and it's a wonderful book and I don't want to criticize Kevin too much because it's just a fantastic book and he does a great job and he worked with Cyril O'Regan as have you. Um, but you say in your introduction, and you, that you think origin is a is a, a better candidate, uh, and that, that Balthazar really does have a turn towards Alexandrian theology, a kind of Cyrillian Christology, uh, uh, the Johannine word word theology, um, and and so may, maybe you could comment on on that on that the, the the importance of of you know origin as a theologian in Balthazar's theological method. Absolutely. Um... I mean, Balthazar says as much. I mean, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, Kevin, I think is right about the sort of um, architectonic stuff with Irenaeus. Um, but so what I argue in the book is that um, if we were talking only about um, kind of method, origin to me seems to be the more likely uh, figure. Yeah. Just because, um, I mean, I think it's in a couple of ways. Um, one is this uh, in in his book on origin. Uh, or his kind of anthology when he pulls together kind of different parts of origin Balthazar um, has a little introduction and he talks about origin as a 
having the voice of something like a gale force wind or like it's this kind of natural disaster <laughs> just sort of like he says the person who's most like origin is Heraclitus which is so interesting to me it's just sort of like moving through this sort of like uh in this energy this kind of uh, dynamic voice um and it can never be reduced to its um it can't be taken apart because then it loses its life right so he says if you try to take origin who said some kind of dodgy things about doctrines and you take those away and you make him really sanitized then it's kind of like he loses his um his umph or something so yeah, he says you know, not, to me like methodologically that's what Baltazar does too right I mean you take origin or anything like Schelling or Soloviev or Bulgakov or Bergson or whoever and you say like okay um what's living here what can what can like we what can we sort of have for Christianity here? What what is uh, what is able to be transmitted in this you know ever organic, ever living um, tradition? Um, and then we can say, sure. I mean, these things are limited. These things have their place. These things are are dead. Um, but you don't want to have this sort of purity discourse where you say this person right. said a dodgy thing, so I don't want to talk about them or to them or engage with them, right? I mean, so so ultimately, even though the book may look like, and it kind of on certain respects is a pretty niche uh, kind of argument about how Balthazar is using all of these kind of um, speculative Russian religious thinkers in, uh, you know, particular zeitgeist in um, modern orthodoxy. It's really about like how theologians should uh, not be so nervous about, about kind of uh, taking in um, anything. And, um, you know, like you, you keep it, um, Christological, you keep it Trinitarian, you 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 have your things that you have to sort of insist upon. Um, but there's this sort of, you know, cancel culture, even in theology, where, you know, you can't talk about yeah. something because of something. And I think that's, um, yeah. to me, everything has something, right? Uh, and I think that was certainly Balthazar's, the case for Balthazar. Oh, it's true. You know, I, I've just recently experienced too, since I've expressed certain sympathies with David Hart's universalism uh, and universalism in general without necessarily endorsing it all, but because, and now I get comments in my in articles, I, well, why should we listen to you since you you're a you're a heretic now that you're marked man mm -hmm. yeah i'm a marked man you know and i feel that that's the way yeah that so many treat origin it's like oh well he was he was condemned wasn't he originism was condemned why are we even talking to him um so i think that's that's an excellent point uh, that you make I think, about i think just to briefly i forgot to say this earlier but um the other thing that i think makes uh, origin so amenable to Balthazar is the way that he reads the scriptures, right? So that the, he has this yes. really, um, kind of live way of reading the scriptures. And uh, for Balthazar, when he's thinking about, you know, sometimes biblical historians um, will critique Balthazar for reading, you know, reading things kind of all out of joint, out of their context, out of their sort of history. Um, but he's reading the scriptures more like a patristic does than a sort of historical, critical, biblical scholar does, right? I mean, he's reading, you know, he Origen will say, the reader of scripture uh, has to pray and has to be part of the church. And that's what kind of gives someone the credentials to read the scriptures. And we read them kind of liturgically. We read them um, as if they are not siloed. I mean, I'm not, you know, Balthazar himself was, you know, affirmed the value of the historical critical method. I'm not saying anything against that. It's just, um, there's this kind of richer way of reading that I think Balthazar liked about origin, which is another reason uh, he's Absolutely. such a good writer. Just well, the, I mean, go, yeah, I was going to ask you, Hauser. Go yeah. ahead. No, th this is this is awesome, and and uh, and and we're getting onto another, I think, really really important point about Balthazar Peggy and uh, and others, and this is also true of Chesterton too. Is is a kind of a confidence that the truth of the Catholic faith is big enough to to house a, a lot of partial truths that are found, and it's so there need not be a fear of of engaging even Hegel, you know, uh, yeah. origin. I mean, all these people, I mean, uh, uh, Balthazar once told, you know, uh, big Dave Schindler that he had learned a lot from Hegel. And I mean, that that's kind of would have been scandalous at the time that he said it probably, but, but it's just a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a confidence there that the truth, which is, you know, the incarnate word of God is, is, right. is it can handle all of these partial truths and, 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 um, yeah, so there's there. You think about the way that uh, 
I mean, even even Chesterton does this in in orthodoxy a lot of times. He'll he'll bring in Nietzsche and he'll bring in uh, Shaw and he'll bring in all these different characters who's, who who or Tol- he does Nietzsche and Tolstoy in this one chapter and he kind of shows how the orthodox understanding of freedom is big enough to do the partial truth of both of them but it outdoes sure. both of them you know and right. he uses, of course Joan of Arc as the example of who's more Nietzschean than Nietzsche and more Tolstoy right. than, than Tolstoy and I love that rather than this kind of like fearful holding on to this narrow you know set of propositions and then let's not die let's not engage anybody out there because it's going to corrupt us or something right. why would it corrupt us if our truth is is bigger than theirs so to speak i mean that's the right it's it's it's, it's capacious enough to to take it yeah. Baltazar says he who sees more wins right yeah right and, there's that, this, I, love that. I know we're running short on time but there's this great line from peggy from uh, the notes on Bergson and descartes where he's talking about christ and he says he wished to be the material and the object of the exegete and historian in order yeah. that the incarnation be complete and entire, in order that it be honest, his history had to be a human history subject to the historian. His memory had to be a human memory, humanly defectively conserved. In a word, his history and memory had to be made incarnate. I think that's really interesting, you know, in terms of like scriptural, um, you know, thinking about like a very kind of a canonic uh, idea too of the word becoming not just a baby, but also becoming a words to be squabbled about uh, kind of yeah yeah later on. yeah that's interesting yeah and, and so along these lines i mean before we go i do want to talk about uh the famous criticisms of balthazar from karen kilby and others you know that balthazar's theology evinces a sort of a false god's eye view of everything that all of his speculations will amount to a kind of wild archimedean sort of point that he can he can look down um and and Larry, I'm, just hold your thought for one second. I'm going to yeah. duck out because I have a meeting, but I I hope you two keep this going, and I because I want to watch the rest of this because I want to hear especially of the, the answer to that. What oh, you're just thanks talking so much, about, Rodney. It's so, great to so see this you. This has been a blast. I appreciate uh, being able to be here. It's great. Nice to see you, Jenny. So and, great uh, to see you. Yeah, yeah. Take care of yourself. Yeah. Thanks. All right, Hauser. Thank see you later. I'll see you tomorrow for the funeral. See you. Indeed. Yes. Okay. Ciao. Uh, but anyway, there's a great quote here on page 29 of your book where you're talking about Balthazar's theological method. And he goes, at the fun, you say, at the fundament determined by Bolkakov and resonant of origin, we find only a Johannine Galassenheit, which sort of means a letting be. Uh, the self-surrender of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And for Balthazar, this posture is for the theologian simultaneously a thesis and license. I, I thought that was pure genius uh, <laughs> because I think that it really does capture something really important uh, about Balthazar, that it's not an attempt at a bird's eye view or a God's eye view of everything. It really is him uh, groping after the truth, which requires the ascesis of realizing that you're not going to grasp everything. You, you, For all of his emphasis on the gestalt, on the whole, he acknowledges that we can only in rare moments sort of get a sense of the whole through the various fragments uh, that the whole is 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 in and through that the whole is the fragment in some ways. So there is, but there's always going to remain a fragmentation in our understanding of these things, which requires anesthesis. But once you engage in that sort of theological humility and so forth, it does give you a certain then license to sort of right. to sort of yeah <laughs> yeah. So, so maybe you could comment on that and the whole controversy around the God's eye view of things. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I could see uh, what Karen is is thinking, right? I mean, because he is, sure. he talks a lot about, um, you know, the inner workings of the Trinity and, you know, the father is this and the son is this. And, you know, I, I love that stuff. I live for it. Um, that's why I get out of it. It's just the sort of, yeah, the yeah. more speculative, the better for me. Um, but so I can, th- I think I can see what she's saying, but I do think, um, I don't, I do think that it is a misreading of Balthazar's especially Balthazar's entire corpus to say that he uh, thinks he has the whole or he has some kind of privileged view or um, that he has, because he's always talking in these kind of like, you know, like nocturnal sorts of ways, you know, like I, um, you know, you yeah. only see, you, you know, in a lot of ways it's connected, I think, to his doctrine um, of Holy Saturday, because in there, there's that book, um, it's not read very often, but um 
theological anthropology is its English title, but the yeah. German title is um, The Hole in the Fragment, right? And so yeah. in, in that book and other places too, he talks about um, what happens discursively on Good Friday uh, where you don't have a kind of word, you don't have a poised kind of discourse, you have a, a cry of a dying man. And that, um, you know, that th there's actually some nice Claudel stuff um, where we could talk about that if we wanted, but in his book, A Poet Before the Cross, he talks about um, the fact that a cry reaches further than a word, especially the cry of a dying wow. man. So there's this kind of like really um, interesting uh, way in which I think both Balthazar and Claudel are recontextualizing the theological project through the passion and the triduum. But anyway, and then, you know, obviously Holy Saturday is um, where things fall to silence, uh, stunned silence, um, anticipatory silence. Um, but it's well, as you, yeah, as you say in your introduction, I don't mean to interrupt, but it's <laughs> the same point that all of these major elements in our Christology and from the life of Christ, and that's the baseline, the life of Christ, are in a sense, real conversation stoppers. I mean, they, they fragment the, the conversation, they fragment any attempt at speculative rationalization uh, into a grand system. And the, 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 the Annunciation, the Incarnation, the, the you know, the, the very ministry of Christ, his, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his, his ascension, all of those things are, are decentering. They're destabilizing rather than, in a sense, gathering up everything into a nice, neat little package for us. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think that's right. I mean, Balthazar is always talking about um, if we ever see the whole, it's only in a sort of reflective, refractive kind of way, like in some kind of like fragmentary way. Right. I mean, he talks so yeah. much in Theologic One about the um, the limitations of our epistemology. Right. He sounds a lot like Karl Rahner um, in his uh, the Rahner's text on the concept of mystery in Catholic theology that we're, uh, you know, we're kind of proceeding um, through the dark, um, but that that mystery is not just the place where our kind of knowledge runs out, but is the very nature of God. And, um, and so it requires uh, sort of like adoration and worship, um, obedience. The Balthazar says that at the end of the place of theology, the place of theology isn't to come to some answer. The place of theology is to resolve in worship and obedience. Right. I mean, so yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's only, that's what matters, not how much, you know, um, yeah. So, yeah, I think, I think and then then that's sort of why he's drawn to the poets, I think, uh, so very, very much as actually a form of theology. And I think this is something that we have. You said before, and, and I know what you meant, you know, that Peggy is not a theologian. He's not a trained theologian. He's not a theologian. And yet Balthazar's point and including him in him, he included him in this text on theological styles. Right. Uh, so Balthazar's point is actually he is a theologian and perhaps the best theologian that there yeah. is out there um yeah, he says, uh, he's he's the one who unites aesthetics and ethics kind of the very best way i mean so he, he becomes yeah. the sort of um, you know quintessential uh style or for uh, what it is to um to, to sort of recover a theology of glory yeah i once uh to, to to change the topic just a bit the uh i once got an email from somebody i had a conversation we did a video house and i with mike hanby and david c schindler mm -hmm. in which we were talking about peggy and somebody wrote me a kind of pointed email saying why would you bring up peggy since he wasn't even a practicing catholic uh but it, and, and that raises though an interesting point that i because some some viewers that are more knowledgeable of peggy might, might have that rattling around in their heads that um that his actual practice of catholicism was at times a bit spotty, right? Is oh, yeah, I mean, am I, yeah. Yeah, so no, that's absolutely right. What do you what do you make of that? Why is that? What do you make? What I'm not conversant enough with Peggy to know if he somewhere someplace commented on that. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think it's all difficult. Um, he his wife, as I as I recall the details, was not Catholic and refused. Right. As I recall to let his children be baptized. Um, and so, but that was always like a, um, a sort of burden for him. I mean, there's, uh, there's the bit in the portal of the mystery of hope where, um, where the character, the woodcutter father comes and brings his own children and gives them into the care of the Virgin Mary. And he says, he's pulled this sort of trick off, you know, it's a kind of, a, a <laughs> sort of like gotten away with something because he's, yeah. uh, but I, I think um, kind of near the end of his life um, after a kind of like, um, 
difficult. I mean, so a, a lot of this is um, is affected with like the Dreyfus affair, right? So there was, you know, the Catholic Church was kind of on the wrong side of, you know, according to Piggy, um, about the uh, the condemnation of uh, Alfred Dreyfus, um, who was wrongly convicted as uh, like as a spy. It was really spy. out, you know, because he it was anti-Semitic. It was uh, he was Jewish, and so he became the sort of scapegoat. Um, and I think uh, that kind of rattled Peggy uh, in terms of. Um, you know, Catholicism in France at the time, he didn't really sort of identify uh, here. And, you know, he has all these things about um, mystique kind of uh, ossifying into politics, right? I mean, so I think he was nervous about, um, he's he's down on you know, clergy in a lot of places. I mean, he says some kind of, um, he talk, talks about like, bureaucrats and these kinds of things. I mean, so like, yeah, he's, it's a complicated relationship with Catholicism, but I think, um, especially near the end of his life, um, it's not something he uh, abandoned, you know, uh, right. entirely. And, you know, to me, it's the same kind of thing as uh, we were talking about earlier with um, a kind of purity discourse. Um, right. He's, uh, he brings a lot of wisdom. Um, I mean, to me, I mean, he he's the sleeper hit of all my classes. I usually assign uh, the portal of the mystery yeah. of hope at the end, like near Christmas, when I'm teaching a theology course, I'll sort of, you know, manhandle it in there somewhere. <laughs> you know, whatever yeah, well, I, that's why I love him. I, I don't bring that up as a criticism, yeah. but just because it's the elephant in the living room for a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, sure. of a certain mindset, you know, in yeah. the cancel culture. And so I bring it up because, but I actually think in a lot of ways he's, He's kind of instructive for our times now and maybe more relevant than ever in the sense that you have a lot of people out there who are truly believing Catholics in profound ways, as, as Peggy was, and yet who are just sort of hanging on by their fingernails yep, exactly. because they're so disgusted with with what they see in, in the church today. And mm -hmm. so I, I say Peggy could be like the patron saint of yep. hanging on to the to, to, to the practice of the faith by your fingernails, even as you internally embrace it thoroughly. Right. No, I think but, that's right. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, he's he's so good about um, keeping the like the the spiritual uh, resonances of I mean, the the yeah. Thing I keep thinking of as you're talking, um, how he's describing in the beginning of Portal this um, this thin, trembling flame, um, you know, on the altar, uh, which has borne the weight of worlds, right? This some fragile thing, yeah. and yet we haven't managed to put it out, despite the fact that we're kind of terrible. Um, you know, we try, you know, we try or we don't try, um, and to well, me, what... the, the enduring kind of quality or the enduring nature of um, of the church you know, in, in its institution, but in, in Christ, um, I think that, that there's a, there's a consolation there. Um, it looks fragile and it is fragile, but it's not gone. Yeah, we, and we, we, we haven't, we haven't completely annihilated the flame. We just turned it into an electric votive candle. <laughs> That's right. So back to the beginning of our conversation. <laughs> well, yeah, but no, yeah, it, it's, it's, but there's something, there's something instructive in that, I think, you know, that uh, we we have in many ways in the church, they lost the flame, the real flame. We have lost it, yeah. but we, we've created a simulacrum of it and, and plug it into the wall and say, okay, we're, we're good. We're still good. Uh, and, and yet I, I think, I think Peggy would have been horrified by it, uh, by the electric votive candle, uh, and and would have said, no, 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 no. If if you've extinguished the real flame, you've extinguished the flame. Better to keep the real flame alive. Right. Uh, but anyway, um, do you have any last words? We should probably wrap this up. We've been sure. going up about, about an no, hour and fifteen just, minutes. It's been a pure delight. I've been enjoying our conversation. I'm so um, honored that you read my piece and I have my book. And uh, it just is, as I said, I think in an email, I'm always surprised when people read anything. <laughs> I just think I send it out. Well, like and, and that uh, never goes away. I yeah. <laughs> I remain mystified to this day why my blog is popular, that right. anybody reads it at all. I throw some garbage out there and it's like, yeah, hey, wow, this sure. is a great thing. Uh, but anyway, no, I am, as, as a 64-year-old curmudgeon here, I uh, am just I'm constantly impressed by this cadre of, of bright young scholars such as yourself, just Cirolo, uh, Jordan Wood, others that, that are out there, uh, you know, just doing fantastic work, carrying the resource mont flame uh, mm. forward. 
uh, in really significant and important ways. So I thank you not only for coming on today, but for everything that you're doing out there at uh, Notre Dame. And uh, keep on doing it and, and say hi to Cyril O'Regan for me if you see him. I sure will. I see him a oh. lot, so I will, I'll say hello. And, and John Betts, by the way. John, I know John. He's, he's a great guy. Uh, so, anyway, But thank you so much, Jennifer, for, for, for coming on. And uh, we'll hit, thank you. stop recording now.